welcome uh, to Wood and Body, a curatorial talk with Jennifer Nava Milliken. Um, I'm Katie Sorensen, and I am the um, Senior Manager of Partnerships and Engagement at the Center for Art and Wood. Um, and I'm just going to go over a little housekeeping um, before we get started. Um, during the program, I just ask if everyone could stay muted. Um, at the end, we may, we'll probably have a little bit of time where we can um, take some, some verbal questions. If you have questions during the program, just go ahead and add them to the chat and I can moderate those uh, with um, Nava. Um, if you would like to use the subtitle option uh, with Zoom, if you just take your cursor down to the bottom of your screen and click the, the little icon that has the CC on that, um, then that'll pop up for you. Um, yeah, and um, I would like to um, just start with um, an acknowledgement. The Center for Art and Wood is situated on the traditional and unsurrendered territory of the Lenni Lenape people who were and continue to be active stewards of these lands and of the river of human beings, more commonly known as the Delaware River. We humbly recognize and express our gratitude to those whose territory on which we work. While we admit that this recognition is a small gesture, we hope we hold up indigenous visibility and affirm the sovereignty of individuals and communities who live here now and for those who were forcibly removed from their homelands. We at the Center for Art and Wood will work to hold the center accountable to the needs of American Indian and indigenous peoples. Our acknowledgement is a sign of our commitment to beginning the process of working to dismantle ongoing legacies of settler colonism and to recognize the hundreds of indigenous nations who continue to resist, live, and uphold their sacred relations across their lands. So tonight we are talking with Nava, or formally in her work life, Jennifer Nava Milliken, who is also our artistic director here at the Center for Art and Wood. Um, before she came to the center in 2018, she worked as an independent curator and consultant following her tenure at the, as the curator of craft and design and the interim curatorial director at Bellevue Arts Museum, shortened BAM, mm -hmm. just for fun, you know, in Seattle, Washington. Before joining BAM, she established Inter Alia Projects, a curatorial enterprise based in Tel Aviv, Israel, and New York. Inter Alia fostered dialogues surrounding contemporary art, studio craft, design, and new media through site-specific pop-up exhibitions, gallery programming, writing, and advocacy for artists pr uh, practicing in these fields. Foreign Body Giving Jewelry a Second Look was Inter Alia's inaugural exhibition in 2012. The catalog documents the work of 15 emerging and mid-career jewelry artists in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. Milliken has lived in several locales, including Jerusalem, New York, Seattle, Seoul, and Tel Aviv. She has been embedded staff member at a number of uh, cultural institutions and museums, among them the Museum of Arts and Design, and the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. She serves on the board of the Furniture Society and Craft Now Philadelphia and is a member of the International Council of Museums, Art Table, AAMC, Association of Art Museum Curators. Milliken remains in demand as a lecturer and writer due to her expertise in contemporary craft and design. In, in addition to Wood and Body, her most recent exhibitions include traveling exhibitions, Humaira Abid, Searching for Home, and Damian Davis, Color Cargo, Moving Image Matters, Documenting and Performing Craft and Video, the Center for Art in Wood, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, um, Electric Coffin, uh, Future Machine, Metamorphosis, The Bam Biennial, and Atoms and Bites, Craft in the Digital Age, and uh, Unresolved Issues, New Glass from Israel, or uh, 
oh, it was shown at the Urban Glass Brooklyn. Um, she authored and uh, edited the publication Humaira B. Taboo, which was released in 2018. Uh, letting people in. Uh, <laughs> uh, in conjunction with the traveling exhibition of the same name, she has written on contemporary jewel jewelry issues for Metalsmith Magazine and Art Jewelry Forum, including the 2015 publication Shows and Tales on Jewelry Exhibition Making. With that, I'm going to hand it over to you, Nava. Thanks, Katie. Um, wow, it's it's kind of fun to be um, your own guest at your own organization. Um, so I will I'll make the most of this opportunity. Thank you so much, Center for Art and Wood, for. Um, inviting me to speak about this exhibition. Before I do, um, I, I did uh, put a note out earlier today um, about, let me see if I can show you this, this book, uh, which just arrived to me last week or maybe the week before. This is a publication of the Museum of Arts and Design. It's Jewelry Stories, Highlights from the Collection, 1947 to 2019, and it's a really beautiful and very special and meaningful documentation of the first um, dedicated curatorial um, collection in a US museum um, dedicated to contemporary jewelry. So, and that was founded by Ursula Ilse Neumann, um, who has since, re I think she re retired in 2015 from the museum. Anyway, I'm very, very proud to be a part of this um, exhibition. Uh, publication and discussion, um, and it beautifully intersects with uh, what we're talking about today. So um, be sure to get your hands on this important book um, that was edited by curator at um, MAD, Barbara Paris Gifford. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen with you all because I have quite a bit of um, eye candy to share with you today. Um, so today's talk um, uh, really is a kind of discussion um, that centers on wood and body expressions in contemporary jewelry, which opened here at the center on July 2nd. Um, originally, this exhibition was planned to open in May 2020 uh, to coincide with the Society of North American Goldsmiths um, conference, which was meant to be here in Philadelphia last year. Um, I know that there were two other exhibitions in, um, in Philadelphia that were organized also to take place last year at the same time. And um, happily, they have been open um, to intersect with the run of Wood and Body, um, one of which recently closed at the Moore, the galleries at Moore College. Um, this was Rings that was organized by Helen William Strutt and um, researched by Elizabeth Esner. Um, and then there's another exhibition of fine jewelry at in Liquid Gallery. And I think that's still going on. Um, our show will continue through November 7th. And uh, I'm just very, very thrilled uh, to have this opportunity to revisit these familiar conversations and concerns of contemporary jewelry um, through the serendipitous intersection of two worlds that are now very present in my, my daily thoughts, uh, both the material of wood and art and adornment. Um, we are so fortunate to see so many visionary and creative metalsmith jewelers um, dedicating themselves to this material, which is one of the first to be used, shaped and manipulated by humankind ever. And of course, if artists didn't continue to activate the material and explore and mine it for all of its physical, uh, visual, as well as narrative properties, then I wouldn't be sitting here uh, with you today. So I'm just very, very energized um, every single day uh, by, by the work that's, that continues to um, be produced by artists working around the world. Um, I do need to thank, before we go further, the participation of the collectors who generously released um, their works for the purpose of being shown in this exhibition. And as such, 
they sacrifice their ability to actually wear these works. And I know from my side, that is a very big deal. So um, it is no small sacrifice whatsoever. Um, so I want to thank Fleur Bressler, Susan Kempen, Helen Williams, Drat English, and um, for their, their generous and um, very considerate lending of their works for this exhibition. And then also Ornamentum Gallery in Hudson, New York. So the exhibition many of you have visited and you know this uh, is, is actually the first exhibition that was organized to be installed in the center's permanent collections, uh, museum collection space. Um, there is a certain, there was an intention behind this. Uh, first of all, it was justified by the, by the fact of the museum collection holding a few works in contemporary jewelry um, and they make up about 20% of uh, this exhibition presentation. Um, and I should acknowledge the donors of these works to the center's collection. Um, they are artists Rebecca Klodziliak, Albert and Tina Lekoff, um, and the Helen Williams Drug Family Collection in memory of H. Peter Stern. The center's Museum collection was established to build a public resource of works that are exemplar of the creativity, innovation, and exploration that Wood allows. It's now made up of 1,200 works dating from the early 20th century through to 2021 that document the growth of the field of um, sculptural and expressive wood turning and by extension art in wood, including craft and design, uh, throughout the later half of the 20th century and into the 21st century. The works in the center's holdings encompass sculpture, wood turning, sculptural furniture, vessels, installations, works on paper, video, and much, much more. As per the mission of the center, we exert great effort uh, to making the collection available to the public. And um, when it established its presence here uh, 10 years ago on uh, North Third Street in Old City, it adopted an open study display approach that the physical works would be accessible for viewing and research. Of course, the entire database is available for research online as well. So wherever you are, you can always access information uh, about the center's collection and about the works in it. Um, and happily, we are um, looking at uh, one, the first part of the exhibition here in the Center's Gallery as it is installed now. So you can kind of get a sense of, of where we're at with the show. Backing up uh, several millennia, <laughs> I did want to give uh, kind of started an origin point for um, the human race and woodworking. Um, and as, as many of us know, wood has been used for many, many thousands of millions of years by the evolving human race for shelter, for fuel, for mobility, um, for tools. Um, it comes with its own ancient history uh, and, um, and it intersects with human technological development. The trees, themselves continue to be mysterious uh, to, to science and um, we continually discover new things about them um, that enrich our understanding of this planet. It is universally one of the oldest and most traditional materials that is used in adornment and it is represented for thousands of years in nearly all cultures. The development of skills and handicrafts and approaches developed to shape, size, and add texture and color to wood meant for wear on the body. Like jewelry, sculpture, or shelter and furniture um, all respond to the body and its proportions and needs. It's logical to think that the materials serve the purposes of housing, supporting, and adorning the body, and that architecture and the techniques honed over time influence approaches to the material at any scale. And when we look at contemporary work, we can see a fluidity of, of the uses of those techniques um, across different scales. And, um, and across different uses as well. So this object is a, what's known as a shabti. Uh, it first appeared during the early Middle Kingdom of ancient Egypt. Um, it was a funerary figure that was um, carved and painted 
um, to not to represent the deceased with whom it was buried, but actually um, to have its own characteristics. And the idea was that when, when the deceased was called to carry out labor in the next world, these chaptis were going to act in their place and perform the labor for them. So they're almost like a legion of servants that escort and then continue to serve as staff for um, the, the person who has passed away in the next life. The traditional form is like that of a wrapped mummy um, with, without defined arms or hands, um, or a sign of ambiguous uh, rendering of arms and hands. And um, they are inscribed with the, the, the owner or the deceased person's name so that, that they are known to accompany them. So they were actually escorting the body and made to be the proportion of the body. Um, they were about uh, between like a foot tall to plus or minus a couple of inches. Um, so really like arm held. Um, so the jewelry, as we recognize it, conversation evolves uh, much later. I'm looking here at a work from the mid 19th century um, during a time when there was actually a lot of exploration of different materials and jewelry. And we can think about Victorian um, memento jewelry, which involved the hair, the weaving of hair or the placement of hair in, in lockets and um, other kind of objects that were meant to be worn on the body that were much more conventional examples of jewelry. Um, we see here a mid 19th century piece, as I mentioned, um, that was that was created within the Tiffany house. Um, and you can see that there are carved oak um, depictions here uh, that actually serves as the gem in this set of earrings and in the brooch as well. Um, the, the oak comes from a legendary tree. It was called the Charter Oak in Hartford, Connecticut. And it really, stood as a witness to the movement of the colony toward independence from the time of King James II um, in the late 17th century until it was felled um, in the mid 1800s. So in, this is a case of the wood being a witness to history and serving as the value, um, the principal value in this precious jewelry piece rather than um, the material itself. And it's kind of, it serves as a, I find it interesting because it, it really precedes more contemporary strategies of jewelry artists to seize on the more ephemeral and narrative properties of wood and to connect them with the objects that are meant to be worn on the body. So kind of connecting the provenance of wood or the, the aspect of the tree being a witness to history to um, wearability in the body. Uh, jumping forward, um, almost 100 years, uh, it's important to, when tracing the history of contemporary jewelry, it's important to uh, mention costume jewelry, which emerged in the 1940s during wartime as rations meant that otherwise glamorous women who were prevented or could not have access to uh, fine jewelry or um, fine clothing and fashions, they would compensate with jewelry that was made from cheap non uh, metal materials such as bakelite, fabrics, plastics, and of course wood. And um, here we're looking at a piece from the 1940s that was made out of uh, wood, plastic, and glass altogether. Um, so the ease, there was an ease in manipulating these materials, which introduced a do-it-yourself approach to in individualizing and customizing uh, one's appearance, uh, which kind of released these more subtle forms of decoration and ornamentation for the body. Um, and then that continued past the war's end. It actually opened a path to exploration and the pairing of unconventional materials with refined metalsmithing techniques, even as access to fine metals became more available. In the 1980s, we saw wood enter um, the world of fashion jewelry. And this is um, a cuff bracelet and then two bangles by uh, Ralph Lauren from the late 80s. And uh, they are out of turned burl. Um, and 
from our point of view, we can maybe explore a little bit uh, the alignment with the growth of wood turning as a as an art form at that same time, and also as a, an occupation um, of hobbyists. But um, but also significant, and also what I wanted to mention here is this kind of connection between. Um, trends in furniture design. Uh, we call this period in the late 80s a period of brown design in furniture, where there were a lot of deeply hued um, woods that were, and, and heavy forms that found themselves in, um, in interiors throughout the world. Um, and, uh, and the way that Ralph Lauren brought them to intersect with fashion. Also in the late 20th century, the uh, jewelry house Patricia von Muslin was creating uh, these kind of sculptural forms in ivory. Uh, later on, when ivory was um, restricted and banned um, for use in fashion, uh, she revisited her ivory designs and then we created them in carved and wood. And, um, she was particularly using uh, ivory and woods that would lend themselves to like scrimshine or, or kind of parallel scrimshine techniques in, in wood. And so the work you see here was made out of ebony and then, and then this kind of pointillist um, application of metallic paint, silver paint, and she would also use gold leaf, were, were brought in to embellish these uh, forms. And they continued, it's actually a rather successful series, and they continued to produce it for um, some 15 or 20 years into the 21st century. In the 21st century, as we got to this, this period of time, uh, which we call star architecture, where uh, luminaries of uh, early 20th century, uh, 21st century architecture came on the scene and were recognized as household words. Um, we have a number of fine jewelry manufacturers turning to them and commissioning jewelry lines uh, from them. And so there were very high profile collections that were designed by Oscar Niemeyer, Richard Meyer, Zaha Hadid, and also, as we see here, Frank, uh, Frank Gehry. Um, his collaboration with Tiffany included six separate jewelry collections, as well as objects for the home, like candlesticks and tabletop items. In the words of the Tiffany press release announcing the collaboration, in the hands of this master builder, precious metals, stones, and wood are interpreted in provocative new shapes highlighted with brilliant color, patina, and rich grain. Uh, the idea was that in their words, Gary's revolutionary aesthetic, which has quote, literally redefined architecture, will change the rules of jewelry and fashion to equal and spectacular effect. This was the, these were in the words of the Tiffany Design House. In this series, um, he married his, his um, sort of technological developments in um, CAD facilitated design to, with natural materials and natural forms um, and really drawing from nature um, to create these, these jewelry wearable pieces. Um, and they were given names such as fish, orchid, fold, and equus or horse. Um, uh, and, I, and I think that it's, it's very clear here that he was trying to ground um, the, the architectural practice for which he'd become very, very famous, which had, which had sort of departed from natural materials. Here he's trying to bring that back together and show that he could, he, would, he was inspired by nature, nature and natural materials and that he could design in those materials as well. Um, and so he's looking at a marriage of form and material in the name of sensual pleasure to be worn on the body. And of course, this is underscored by the use of the material of wood. Uh, backing up a little bit, as we get into the discussion of contemporary jewelry and its emergence, we can look to um, New York in the, in the post-war period and, um, and in the work by a number of artists such as Man Ray, Pablo Picasso, Dali, and most famously Alexander Calder, who made jewelry pieces for their clients and for their friends. Um, and of course, here we're looking at two works by Louise Nevelson, who did the same. 
It's important to mention that um, even though a lot of these works will, will be parallel to the same concerns that they applied to their larger or more recognized bodies of work, um, they, despite being scaled down to the body, um, they were not really intended to be seen in the same in this or criticized in the same ways that their works were. They, they often made these for friends and then for exchanging between clients as little mementos or, or gestures of thanks to their clients um, and, um, and, and were much more personalized rather than seen as, as a real kind of career path. Um, having said that, I will say that um, Dali and notably Dali out of all of these, and then of course Calder actually fabricated these pieces themselves. So it was really, they, they were demonstrating their craft at the same time um, as, as creating these smaller works. Um, so it's important to note that um, in, a, in a field where many artists were commissioning um, craftspeople to kind of in, bring form to their visions. There were some who were really concerted uh, makers themselves. Contemporary jewelry is a practice that emerged in the second half of the 20th century as skilled metalsiths um, stretched their studio techniques and their design principles to critique conventions of jewelry and to express conceptual ideas in their work. Contemporary works of adornment often seem unfamiliar to conventional jewelry and its traditions and may even agitate the body rather than conform to it. When they are worn, they engage with the dialogue, the maker and uh, the wearer, as well as the environment and society in which the wearer moves. And this, this constant dialogue and this conversation about movement um, and conforming or submitting or dominating the body is one that really permeates the field um, to this day. Uh, what, some of the things that, that contemporary jewelers might critique include uh, the ritualistic and talismanic properties of traditional and ethnographic jewelry, um, the ideas of possession and currency or preciousness, uh, scale proportion and the hierarchy of the body and its relationship to the worn object, gender signs and in, in gendering um, between the, the worn object and the body. Uh, channels of making and distribution, uh, and then of course elements of function. So the little design elements that that are required to make jewelry a piece of jewelry. For example, if it's to be worn on the neck, then there is um, maybe a closure that allows you to fasten it. Or if it's a ring, there is a there is a band that attaches it to the finger and keeps it there. In the US, um, there was a simultaneously, I, I mean, what I, what I spoke about just now was really based in more on what was happening in Europe. And, and um, I should mention that this work by Heis Bakker, he was really one of the, the uh, thinkers on the forefront of, of um, this movement. And he and his colleagues were schooled in design rather than um, metalsmithing. Uh, exclusively, and so they were also drawing from from this emerging field of speculative design and bringing those concerns into their work as well. And I think that that might account for some of the um, the thinking and the lack of reverence for um, for fine materials and precious um, gemstones, and and that opened up um, a path of inquiry for these um, these makers. In the United States, um, the, the contemporary jewelry field was really pushed forward by um, the designer crafts movements of the US and the studio craft movement um, across the country. Uh, and, and in these fields, traditional metalsmiths uh, would come up with surprising new forms and proportions that were still eminently wearable, still demonstrations of fine craft but um, in surprising, often organic forms. Um, and two early progenitors of this field were Art Smith, whose work is seen here in this image, um, and Margaret Dipada, who uh, 
about 10 years ago at the Museum of Arts and Design, there was a, there was a retrospective exhibition of, of really important um, scholarship on her, her life and her work that was organized by Ursula Isa Neumann. Um, a little bit about art. He's, he's the guy that you see in this um, central image here. He studied at Cooper, he, Cooper Union Art School in New York, and then he opened up a shop while he was there um, in Greenwich Village. And um, he, he moved around in circles with um, avant-garde and modern dance. Um, and was really inspired by, by the idea of movement in the body and um, sort of untraditional movements of the body and um, then this contemporary choreography. And this is, a, this is kind of the underscoring of a lot of the forms that he developed. I should mention that early on, there would not have been a development of this field without um, the galleries that supported it and also took on the responsibility of connecting with um, the academic institutions that, that trained these artists while um, also linking them and educating um, collectors and um, potential and future clients in this field. So on the left, we have Maria Jose Vandenhout, um, who is the founder of Gallery Marse in Nijmegen in, um, in the Netherlands. And um, here she's pic pictured with Otto Kunzli and um, Dorothea Pohl. Uh, and um, Dorothea's work is included in this exhibition and she's really uh, given, given a name to um, wood and contemporary jewelry and we'll see that work in a few minutes. Um, Gallery Marsha has been really, really critical in, um, in advocating for contemporary jewelry and um, Marie Jose in, in particular has um, been very good about identifying emerging talent and, um, and she early on set up uh, an event called the Marche International Graduate School, which identifies um, young talent. Um, and uh, it's an enormous honor to be included in this very high profile event every year. Um, on the right is Paul de Rey, who was the founder of Galerie Ra in Amsterdam, um, which was active between 1978 or 1975 until 2017. And here he is seen with his own work um, in an acrylic uh, neck piece. Um, and of course, here in Philadelphia, which emerged as also a, um, a, a very rich ecosystem for contemporary jewelry and continues to this day. Um, here on the left, we have Helen williams Strutt English in her gallery, which is renowned for um, the research and um, the tracing the trajectory and recording it and also advocating for contemporary jewelry in the US as well as abroad. And on the right, we have Rick and Snyderman who founded Snyderman Works Galleries um, and among studio craft furniture and objects in all of the major material fields, they also showed a lot of jewelry in the, in the many years of their operation. So that brings us to our exhibition, uh, Wood and Body Expressions in Contemporary Jewelry. This exhibition is small. It uh, consists of 26 works by 25 artists, but it's also international. Um, and it seemed really important to bring works by artists from around the world into this discussion. It is not comprehensive by any means, but it does offer a range of approaches, concepts, and questions while also encouraging viewers to consider the creative potential of wooden adornment. In putting this project together, I had three aims. One, that those who appreciate art and wood be moved to consider the conceptual possibilities of this art form and the rich context introduced by bringing the woodworked object within close context of the body. Two, that on the other side of the spectrum, those that are um, literate and appreciate of contemporary jewelry consider the conceptual possibilities of wood. And then three, that the relationship between the human body and the material of wood be considered in a new way. So um, 
in throughout all of these works and what unites them is is a beckoning for a new way of valuing jewelry um, uh, which is a continuation of the inquiry that was launched by the emergence of this field um, it was important to bring in a wide array of approaches and forms and um, also represent at least with one work if not more each of the major uh, typologies of, of jewelry. So we have um, earrings, neck pieces, rings, and bracelets and brooches. Um, I hope I haven't missed anything. It's also important to note here that uh, when I talk about contemporary jewelry and wood, and particularly for the parameters that were that were set up for this show, um, I did not look for creative salvage or found objects. Many times when we think of, um, in the wider field, when we talk about contemporary jewelry and, and wood is introduced, it's often um, as a kind of found or, or in the words of Ramona Solberg, um, a sourced object and or a sought object. And I wanted it to be really apparent to those who are viewing the exhibition that the work in Wooden Body is actually a demonstration of craft of woodworking techniques as well as uh, metalsmithing techniques. I didn't want to go into that kind of eco direction of looking at salvage as, as, um, as something with environmental concerns or, or the sort of trash to treasure genre. I didn't want to align with that. The, the work in this exhibition is, is a conscious and concerted effort by the artists whose work is in it um, and a demonstration of their skills in the material. So curators in organizing exhibitions will also break, will always sometimes break up the discussions into sections. So for the purposes of digesting the stories in a wood and body, I delineated four categories. The first is called the poetics of the familiar. And in this section, we have um, works that kind of demonstrate a use of a familiar object and a reappropriation of it into something that's unfamiliar. So there's, there's sometimes, as we see in this work here by Gord Pederen, um, a kind of subversive play on a, on a familiar or often very banal daily object. Um, or we have a familiar material um, shaped into a wearable but very unconventional form, like this bracelet by Lisa Spiros on the right. Um, the, the work by Gord Pederen is actually quite fun. He, out of all of the artists in the exhibition, is least um, aligned with contemporary jewelry. His uh, body of work, for those who um, are not familiar with him, ranges everything from um, furniture to textiles to painting to drawing um, and everything in between. So here in the work that's shown here, um, he attached a pencil sharpener to, um, well, actually it was the pencil he attached to the lathe, um, which is used in, if you're, if you're not familiar with this equipment, it's, the, it's kind of the um, wood equivalent to um, a potter's wheel where a piece of wood material is applied to an axis and then it spins and, um, and then the cutting tool is introduced to shape the material. And so that's where the pencil sharpener comes in. And this bracelet is actually composed of one very, very long continuous pencil shaving that was then carefully formed into a wearable bracelet. You'd have to have very small wrists for this one though, I admit, but it is, um, it is wonderful in its color um, and its shape and it encourages us to think about the material in a new way. Marjorie Schick was quite well known in her long career for these exuberant structures um, that she built from wood or paper mache and other household materials and paints. And um, this untitled work here from 1985 uh, is, a, is a very, it's a brooch and it's about uh, nine inches tall. So it really sits on the breast area um, prominently and you have to kind of, it, it almost wears you as a frame rather than you wearing it. And that, that is typical of, of quite 
many of her works. This is actually one of the smaller works in her in her um, corpus. Much many of the other pieces, especially the paper mache works, are actually like these peacock like. Um, crowning adornments that that situate themselves on the body and and wrap around a feature of it. Um, this piece in particular connects to modern studio furniture. Um, we can think of the the red blue chair, of course, um, and early 20th century movements um, in architecture and furniture. Uh, I just included this uh, this image um, because it shows Marjorie herself, she would often model some of her work. And um, this was in a 1983 show at Galerie Ra in um, Amsterdam. Vered uh, Babai, and I'll just show, this is an example of, of a work that led to her current series. Um, this is a, a long series um, called Circuits where she would take gathered um, natural materials, um, and like findings from trees that were that were left on the sidewalk, and then apply them to some very rigorous metalsmithing techniques to get them to submit to her rigid geometries um, and forms. Um, she began to use uh, the leavings from her metal practice, so she would gather filings of fine silver or dust, and um, and eventually pencil shavings, and then apply them to um, certain kind of configurations and compositions. And when she started with the pencil shaving series a couple of years ago, she was really not thinking about the body um, with these objects. She was thinking more of their, their the kind of tension that they would lend to a pictorial composition and so she was arranging them in these, like, these little configurations and then posing them against photographs that she had taken in land in the landscapes of um, Israel and in the Negev desert and then setting up these oppositions in this way. Um, this piece which was just made in the spring is actually one of the first um, signs of her returning to the concerns of the body. And um, though she's not really thinking of the body when she makes her work, her, her work is more a discussion between the material and the artist. Um, she does, she was trained as a metalsmith, she was trained as a contemporary jewelry artist, and she can never really escape that, that discussion of the, the pr proportion of the body to which she um, assigns her work. So we saw that image of um, Marie José in um, her gallery with Dorothea Pool. So this is the work of Dorothea Pool. Uh, it's about 12 inches from top to bottom, and each of these little sheaves, or as she calls them, wings or flügel, um, are about five and a half inches each. So. She is one of the more veteran contemporary jewelry artists who was working in wood. Her um, use of it extends pretty much throughout her career. Um, and um, in her work, she is concerned not with narratives at all. Her work is non-referential. It is rather sculptural and concerned with proportion and scale. Um, the body is just a framework. For, for these sculptural forms. Um, she's known for this very raw use of raw and treated wood. Um, and um, the, the forms seem to, they feel kind of naturally occurring, but, but they are her own distinct shapes. Um, and um, so this, is, this work is in the exhibition. Next, um, moving on from Dorotea's work, we can talk about organic structures. Um, many artists working in wood, not just jewelry, but um, across all um, disciplines and formats, think about um, organicism in their work. And um, these artists often use furniture techniques in um, constructing their work, and um, or they are motivated by, by forms found in nature, such as this work on the right, which is by Lucy Lutkova. It's in the Center's collection, and um, it's she's not typically working with wood, but she was moved by watching the 
pebbles in a stream by her home and she wanted to create jewelry that would that would capture that kind of visual effect and so with the stack laminated um, veneers she carved a surface that was undulating and organic but also in the confined shape of this pebble um, it's it's a kind of very comforting handheld object to wear, but it's also it's also a it's a brooch that can be um, applied to the garment. So it's a it's more practical um, among our our uh, selection of works for this discussion. And then on the left we have a work by Ketli Titsa, who is is using wood to connect to um, her childhood, to nostalgic uh, experiences uh, with family, and um, and then also to connect to nature. So this work here, which often which looks like it embodies some um, wooden boat building techniques, is um, is called nature boat. Um, and it was a, a set of memorial pieces uh, rec that were recognizing and saluting her father, who died suddenly a few years ago. These two works by Liv Blaive are, are not in the exhibition. If you have a chance to visit um, or to take a look at the exhibition guide, you'll see that this is this is the work. Sort of hard to see here. Um, that's in the exhibition, but I had these images um, already in hand, and they are really indicative of her her larger body of work. She's also like Dorothea, um, known for her work in wood, and um, and these these works are just quite st stunning to think about wearing. They are. Um, demonstrating tensile strength and architectural approaches that that almost seem to come alive because of the movement that she builds into the works. Uh, there, she often uses maple, which is which is dyed um, in these high key colors. But even though she's using this kind of polychromy in her work, they still seem to connect to nature, and they seem like creatures that could be found and encountered in nature. Um, she's surrounded by wood where she lives in Norway. She lives in a woodworking town and her partner is a woodworker as well. Um, and uh, so she's bringing in shipbuilding um, and, and the, the undulating landscapes where she lives in together in her work. Um, I, I love this work by this new, new emerging artist named Shamaka Thompson, who lives quite close to us in, um, in Silver Springs, Maryland. Um, she's an autodidact and, and she came upon this, this um, compressed wood material and she saw the potential for bending it and, and how began to kind of explore how those forms could conform to the body. So this work, um, is an example of, of the ways that she'll she'll dye a lot of the work with um, with paints or or with natural dyes and then pose them against against natural um, wood color and um, they are they are not unlike Liv Glavarp's work they are not flexible you need to you need to submit to these works but they are no less enjoyable to wear. Um, also in this discussion is Diera Jones' work. Diera is a young artist based in Savannah, Georgia. Um, and these two works came out of her MFA um, thesis project in 2019, where she was a student at SCAD. And they, um, they are a confluence of different processes that removes the wood material so far from nature. Um, they include ceramic, um, and clay, as well as electroforming, and um, there is gold leaf and, and stainless steel, and all of these um, kind of improbable processes coming that are known to metalsmithing um, coming together, and these forms still kind of succeed in creating works that that seem like they could be found in nature and just sort of picked up from under a log. Uh, and I think there's there's such beauty and richness in these these two forms. 
Next, we have Embedded Stories. And here we are looking at a work by David Bielander based in Germany. Um, also more veteran artist among us. And um, like the works in this category, um, this is an example of plumbing the provenance of wood um, in order to bring discussions into play. Um, so this, this uh, work, which is titled Pinocchio, is carved from wood that was sourced from a decommissioned confessional booth from a Catholic church in Germany. And um, it's, it's, <laughs> you can wear it around your neck or you can also wear it on your nose. Um, and it's about six inches in length. And um, I think that's, that's an example of his, his more provocative um, body side of the, of the work that he does. And similarly, Tai Chen, um, he's much more known now for paper sculptures, but this is an earlier work of his called D9. And this is a, a, a really potent example of the power of wood as a documentary material um, and its ability to contribute narratives based on the provenance of that material. Uh, it's carved out of olive wood, um, which is really heavy symbol um, of claims to the land across Palestine and Israel. Um, Atai, who is Israeli but lives now in Germany, carved the brooch from this olive wood material. And in addition to the significance in the spectacular region, it's also known for its sensual qualities, including its fragments, um, the easy ease of carvability because of the density of its grains, and of course, the beauty of its um, hue and grain figure. So D9 is a, is a model of bulldozer, um, and the bulldozers are used by the Israeli Defense Forces to demolish illegal structures or structures that it deems illegal, I should say, including many homes of Palestinian families. So when one, particularly an Israeli, is wearing a piece like this, it's a sign of intent by the wearer um, and a declaration of uh, recognition of inhumane acts admits, admits beauty. Sharon Church is a Philadelphia-based artist and her work in this work actually was seen at the Center for Art and Wood in Craft Now's first exhibition project in 2015. And it's also documented in, um, in a book that I have here called Masters of Craft. Um, this is a wonderful example of contemporary jewelry where so much work and skill has gone into the embellishment and the and ornamentation of this beautifully life-size carved um, and painted frog with um, these it's sort of crowned on its back with these gold and diamond encrusted um, forms. And then it's only when you go to wear it that you realize that those, those little nubbins, as I call them, are actually the closures or the attachments of the brooch to the cloth that you're the of the garment that you're wearing. So when you are wearing it, no one in public will see this this beautiful attention to detail. They'll only see the white soft underbelly of the frog as it's exposed um, in this in this sort of like very vulnerable position um, on the body. So um, it does it is reflective of concerns of. Um, contemporary jewelry artists who are looking at, at critiquing function. This work by Tara Locklear um, is called Survey Arranged Aerial Transfer Necklace. It is wonderfully kinetic um, and there's a fantastic sound that comes from it. If you're familiar with Tara's work, you know that she uses um, uh, discarded skateboard decks and then carves them um, and brings them into these um, very sculptural configurations that can be worn in a number of ways on the body. Um, she also brings in um, kind of building materials or, or manufactured materials, including this um, plastic durat material, which plays beautifully with the wood. She um, does not paint the surfaces of, of her works, rather she sources them as they come into her and um, and then plays with what there is and creates these compositions of color um, based on the way they come to her. So this particular work um, 
features pieces of skateboards that were painted by an artist friend of hers. So he actually painted decks and then they came to her and, and she incorporated them into her jewelry, which is inspired by her experience flying over landscapes. So you, I included this photo here so you could kind of see the direct connection between um, image and impression that's seared on the brain and an experience and then the way she brought that into her um, body of work. I am going to jump ahead a little bit to this last section, which is um, called embodiments. Um, and uh, this kind of sums up the entire concern of the show as it connects to ancestral practices of creating wooden works of adornment, which are often tasked with protecting the body from sinister metaphysical physical forces, or they might have ensured or boosted fertility of the wearer. Um, contemporary jewelry artists might be inspired by long held religious rites involving wood, or they might respond to ancient mythologies that link trees to the human body. And we can think about um, mythologies across all civilizations. There's always a figure that um, is, a, is a tree form. You think about um, the Druids or um, Ovid's metaf metamorphosis, where Daphne is escaping a fate that she doesn't want, and so she she prefers to be turned into a laurel tree than to than to um, submit to the attentions of Apollo. Um, we also have the Chinese tree deity Pi Feng, um, who represents human character and physicality. So um, the fact that, that these stories would find their way into the work of um, contemporary jewelry artists is not a surprise. Um, and on the left, we have a work, a uh, set of earrings from Adam Atkinson, who um, has been working with carved wood for a very long time and positioning it as a stand-in for the human body. So the way that wood can often be carved to resemble skin, um, and softness and, and the supple forms of the body, including genitalia, um, is something that's occupied him for a long, long time. And this more recent work is called Gentle Phallus. Um, um, actually, so I'm going to jump also to KP, who is here with us today. Um, Adam and KP will be participating in a program on Saturday evening um, that's looking at um, queer identity, craft, and woodworking. And so if you're interested in that program, please check in with us. Um, KP, do you want to say, are you able to say a couple of things about, about your work? He's on residency in Baltimore, not very far away, and we're hoping that he can come visit us at the center um, very, very soon. We will come back to you, we'll come back to you. Um, but I, I would love to have you share a little bit about this work. Um, Dania Chelminski's Mended 240 series is, is from 2012. And it was first exhibited in a performative space base um, gallery. It was an exhibition of 240 rings that were cut from one ficus tree um, in her garden outside her studio in Tel Aviv. And she's originally from Mexico, but she immigrated to Tel Aviv um, as a teenager. And um, she is constantly dealing with that question of rootedness and, um, and development and identity. Um, and very with a hyper awareness of the parallels between wood as a living entity with roots um, that can be transplanted um, and cultivated and then spliced, um, just like disrupted life um, straddling different societies. Um, the, the series is actually quite poignant um, because of the way the, the rings themselves seem to uh, resemble pieces, parts of the human body and its appendages. Um, and Dania herself has lost a couple of fingers to her craft. And so um, the way that these forms seem to be cut off and then mended in different ways um, is, is really um, a lovely kind of uh, reckoning with the body and, um, and the hands, which are the basis of her practice. 
This work by Edgar Mosa was um, one of the main muses for this exhibition, um, was aware of this series some years ago, and so the chance to work with it um, in this in the purposes of this exhibition is really, really, really wonderful. Edgar is um, based, born in Portugal, but based in New York City. Um, and um, and brings in a lot of different syntaxes. He's working with material, with ways of working in craft practice and labor, and uh, working against the ancient forms of jewelry and its conferring of status as well as myth. Um, and um, these kind of improbable forms are are um, an assemblage of of prosaic objects like a like a brush that was found um, in a forest where he was living and working while studying at Cranbrook and then coming together to to uh, create the series of jewelry pieces that that is um, sort of like outsized ritual object um, talisman um, um, and and signs of nature all in one um, stunning and dramatic um, wearable object. Um, this is a work by Julia Harrison, and I'm, and I'm going to end it here. This work is not in the exhibition, but it's, it's, I brought it in to show her ongoing occupation with the body. And like Adam Atkinson, she's really looking at carved wood as a, as a way of um, introducing uh, the skin into her work and the human body um, and these fragments of the human body. Um, in this series of work, which is called The Dozen Rosebuds, she used different tones and forms of, of wood species to um, parallel them to, to the range of natural tones and forms of, and of, of the human skin and the spectrum of skin and pigmentation in, hum in the human race. Um, and then I will end here with her cleavage pendant, which is one of a series that's in the exhibition. Um, and uh, this work in particular presents a kind of meta discussion about that brings together a work that's meant to be worn on the body, that's meant to ornament the body, that is actually representational of a piece of the body that lays or is situated on the part of the body that it's depicting. So um, these layers of discussion um, come together in her work, which is also, you know, a, a kind of can be viewed as lighthearted and beautiful and fun um, all at the same time. Um, so I end it there with this thought that, you know, with all of the malleability and generosity of the wood, it is not codependent. It never loses its identity, its figure, um, its spalting and its history. Um, it is not a blank canvas. It asserts itself visually to any artist who, who agrees to work with it. Um, and the use of wood as material for objects of adornment demands dialogues whether they are rituals, structures, mergers, embodiments, organic uh, forms um, that are related to nature, they represent thousands of years of engagement, which the maker undertakes to work in matters of good on the body. So thank you, I welcome questions. So we're gonna open it up then for um, a small group. Um, for those that would like to, um, ask questions, um, go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, I see that KP, um, he's, he's in residency at Baltimore, as I mentioned, and he's not able to speak, but he will be giving a talk about his work on August 2nd at um, the BJC. So that, will that be um, in video or is that an on-site event? He'll put, put it'll, that. Be via, it'll be via, it'll be via zoom as well. Sorry, I do have to. <laughs> thank, thank you so much, Nava. This was a lovely talk. Thank you. Thank you for, for being here. And I look forward to seeing you on Saturday. And uh, we can find out um, how to register for that conversation and then um, send it follow up with information um, for those who are interested in attending. And I definitely um, encourage you to do that. I did place a link to register for the Saturday's event in, in the chat. So if anybody would like to attend, um, please RSVP um, and we'll 
get together and, and have a, a very um, in-depth conversation. Yes, thank you for doing that. Um, I think that that's one of the discussions that can be brought into discussions about um, jewelry, which is not really treated explicitly in this exhibition, but um, I did mention that that idea of jewelry as a, as a signifier of gender is a, is a quite an important discussion, contemporary jewelry, and um, hopefully during throughout the run of this exhibition, we can introduce that as, a, as an event and program. No, but I was wondering if you could um, talk a little bit about like um, we always talk about functional dysfunctional and I think contemporary jewelry um, edges into that. Um, can you talk about why it, it tends to to make it like almost unwearable, but not quite. <laughs> well, first of all, um, there are a lot of ways I could respond to that. First of all, this don't forget that historically contemporary jewelry emerged at a time of rule breaking and modernism is a is is a way, you know, was a time where artists, designers, architects were all looking at the at the forms of the past. Um, and because of some cataclysmic uh, global events were were departing from from the ways of doing things um, and the industrial revolution is a course a very big part of that um, so so function looking at function and rebelling against it or twisting it or critiquing it was was also uh, a concern that was brought into the discussion because that's something that jewelry which is situated in this perfect venn diagram between art craft and design and draws equally from all of those concerns importantly um, is is um, is when it when it's a critique of of its history, it has to critique those things, right? So wearability and function um, gives jewelry its parameters, and um, it defines jewelry. Um, it must be within a scale that responds to the body directly. It must be supported by the body, um, and so these these very defined sets of criteria can also um, serve as starting points for rule breaking, um, which is what, you know, so Sharon Church's Oh No is um, a really nice illustration of that, um, where, where this, um, this beautifully treated object, which is just so exquisite, um, is, is the, the actual elements that make it exquisite are hidden to the viewer and the public. And so when it's trotted around in the public sphere and encountering other people, um, none of those things are ever seen. And so it requires a kind of understanding of vulnerability on the half of the wearer to um, expose themselves in that way while keeping the, the, um, the really ornamented public side to themselves. I think everybody's always kind of shocked to hear that, that that's how that piece is worn and why you would want to do that. But you, as you just said, you know. It's, it's... Yeah, the jewelry artists are playing with you. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, um, and there's this tacit agreement between, between somebody who agrees to or is, is interested in wearing this object. Well, you've got to submit to, to the piece rather than having the piece um, gently or subtly um, play up your features like like cosmetics it's it's a different relationship mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's performative in a lot of ways and I think that's another we could spend another hour talking about yes. the, <laughs> the performance of wearing contemporary jewelry certainly in the works of Marjorie Schick um, when yeah. you're wearing this enormous crown of paper mache and stick that we confine your movement mm -hmm. and, um, and um, are heavy and fragile, um, you are you're engaging with um, in, a, in a discussion with sculpture to be worn. Um, I see that. Um, I think Marion Hunter is um, is joining us, 
and her work is included in the exhibition. Um, and um, I'm just going to um, show everyone um, her work. It's um, this lovely and very narrative um, piece that um, I included in the discussion um, of, um, which discussion was that in? One second. Um, I'm gonna try to talk and show this image at the same time. Um, here it is. It's a work that's called Gathering. Um, and, and there are a number of things that I'd love to um, get Mary Marianne's um, input on, but first I'm gonna show, let's see if I can do this. Um, here it is. Giants Gather is the name of this work. Um, and it's this, this wonderful, um, um, there's so many beautiful things about this piece. Um, it, first of all, there, there are these wonderful kind of technical um, um, realized illustrations of elephants. And um, if you flip around this, um, this the sort of illustrated part, um, of the choker, you have um, this beautiful little poem that Marianne, I assume you wrote this. Um, Giants gather crossing seas of grass along memory's path, rivers of ancient migrations. Um, very, very, very beautiful to be able to, to be privileged to wear this kind of lovely narrative connecting nature um, and these beautiful forms and materials that come from nature on the body. Um, and the other thing that I wanted um, to bring in uh, and that is significant about this work is that Marianne, um, her partner is Bill Hunter, who is a wood turner whose work is in the center's permanent collection. And these wood pieces that you see here, which are um, Coco Bolo wood were um, remnants from the, they were basically like literally from the cutting room floor of Bill's studio. Is that right, Marianne? Yes, it is. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's, it's really stunning. Um, Thank you. Would you mind saying some things about it? Um, it reflects uh, my interest both in Bill's work and, he, you know, I'm his biggest fan and my interest in nature and my uh, enjoyment of bringing all kinds of various materials into the pieces. And these two reminded me of tusks. Mm -hmm. And I'm very conscious of the plight of elephants and other uh, animals in Africa and around the world. So the pieces about Africa and the two most well illustrated pieces are, are the elephants, but there's also a pattern, um, sort of an abstract of a giraffe skin and a zebra skin. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You can see here. Yeah. And then Coco Bolo wood um, comes from. These particular trees are from uh, the mountains above Puerto Varta in Mexico. And it's a, one of the 13 true Dalbergias. Mm -hmm. and, then, um, and then the other materials that are brought in to play with the wood are... Um, uh, uh, quartzes that are included with other minerals and uh, gold and silver. It's, it's, it's just really lovely and also just delightfully narrative um, to encounter it. I, it's embedding so many stories and then it also encourages you to look really, really closely. So it's pulling you in um, as, you, as you encounter the exhibition installation. Um, Thanks. Thank you. Really, really wonderful. Thank you, Marianne. And thank you for coming. Well, of course. <laughs> Um, let's see. Um, I, I think we can, if you if you like, feel free to unmute yourself um, and then just 
toss out your comments or, or any questions that you have, um, um, I would welcome that. And so I think, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just thinking how um, this really expands what uh, most people think of when they think of jewelry, especially if they're unfamiliar with, um, with what's going on in contemporary jewelry and only familiar with the kind of silhouettes and forms that are in um, mass produced jewelry. It expands that and it's like, oh, that's, that's what jewelry can be. And it's exciting for, just for that reason. Thank you for saying that. I, I obviously have always found it exciting. I, um, I, I know from the early days of showing it in, um, in Tel Aviv, the conversations would often be like, well, this is beautiful work. It's very museological. That was a word that came up a lot. It's very museological, but I don't, I would never wear this on myself. And I was always asking people, why not? It's it's such an invitation to take part in a in a fun conversation and who else is so generously asking you to wear their artwork around? So I accept that invitation and I and I encourage all of you to accept it as well. And, and Clara is here. Clara was visiting the exhibition mm -hmm. today with Ben. <laughs> Notice. Yes, thank you. That's one of the works from the Mended 240 series, okay. series by Dania Chominski. And I, I will, um, I think it's so fun that Clara, that you chose that piece because it's, it's just so lovely. Um, and I will say that even though it looks improbable for wear, I've had one of the pieces from that series for almost 10 years. And it is, it is as wonderful to wear now, if not more than the day that I, that I got it. So, um, you know, would the experience of wearing wood over time, um, those of you here, and there are many people who understand wood as a, as a material, you oh, know wow. that it changes. Um, it changes with, with warmth and moisture and exposure to the oils of the body. So that's an expectation that's introduced by artists who are making wearable work in wood as well. I have to tell you that I have enjoyed wearing it all afternoon. <laughs> Much more comfortable. Oh. And adapts to the way that she shaved the bottom and the sides really adapts to my body. Mm -hmm. And I loved your um, talk today. It was very elegant and meaningful. Thank you very much. Thanks, Clara. Thank you. Thanks. Good to see you. Well, um, Feel free to, to um, stop by or send me a line or, or continue this conversation um, throughout. The show is up through um, the beginning of November. So we have a lot of time to ruminate on this discussion. Um, and, uh, and I'm looking forward to that opportunity. And we'll be doing a lot of um, conversations um, involving artists from the exhibition um, like KP, and and Adam and Julia and Mary Marianne and and all of these wonderful people throughout the run of the show. So I just I'm so honored and um, and thrilled and um, overwhelmed almost <laughs> at the at the opportunity of this exhibition. Um, Marianne is asking if if the exhibition is uh, traveling. There are no plans to travel this exhibition, but I, I see this show as being um, a launch for uh, the possibility of more ambitious looks at wood and jewelry. Um, I think that I will say, because there are just a few of us here today, um, that, that there is no major uh, documenting publication dedicated to wood and jewelry. There are a couple of how-to books, but at least in the English language and, and um, the, the, the other languages that I know, there is no uh, publication that's, that's really discussing these works strictly in the framework of the material that's being used here. So that is something that I think the Center for Art and Wood is responsible 
to explore. And um, so I think there's a future for this discussion. So I'm a thank you for asking, Marianne. I think that's an important question um, that we that we we need to continue this. I was I was going to say um, on a couple of trips to Germany, they're doing some wonderful wood jewelry. I think I have a couple of brooches that I got there. They're really <gasps> nice. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you're going to have to <laughs> show me them. now. Now, in your work, you've done a couple of wearable pieces. Well, sometimes I just cut up plates for <laughs> to make them into a something but yeah we'll continue this conversation because it's sort of one of the reasons i wanted to watch was that some of the images are so exciting that it opens opportunities mm. um, ah so i like i like where you're headed meryl <laughs> we'll talk more oh good and and didn't you during your time in the bay area didn't you know a lot of these artists as well um, not necessarily ones who are working in wood, but ones who are really getting this contemporary jewelry movement and studio craft off the ground. Mm, I don't know that I that much, um, but I know I went to school at, at UCLA and then Cal State Northridge, and we did some pretty wild, I used acrylic to make pendants and things you wore on your head. Oh. Oops, 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 oops. That's, that's so much fun. And, and I think, you know, we see a lot of people who studied, like you, Meryl, studied architecture and design, um, shifting focus to um, scale down their work and to um, work in this field as well. So, um, <laughs> uh, Carrie Ann and, and Meryl have a lot to talk about. <laughs> uh, old college days. <laughs> um, well, again, I, I so appreciate the chance to talk about this field uh, with you tonight. And please feel free to continue the conversation um, even beyond November. It's, it's really a joy and a pleasure to um, shed light on these artists' work. Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at our next event. Be Thank safe. You. Have a good night. Be safe. <laughs>